otherwise, I'm all done, because uh, I'm sure you guys are done listening to me ramble, and we'll welcome Mark. So, so you can listen to me ramble. Yeah. <laughs> Alright, let me get this video started. Which of these magical touchscreen things do I hit? <laughs> I think it's uh, AX. Oh, yeah. Is it? yeah. oh, here we go. Cool. <laughs> no, keep keep going, Joe. What is it short for? Uh, that's mostly all on the screen. We'll we'll go with it. Cool. Um, so I don't have a good title slide because I forgot to do that. So uh, I'm Mark Stanislav. I am a two-time EMU alumni. So Ooh. I did. Uh, both undergrad from 03 to 07, and then grad school uh, 09 to 2011. Uh, NIDA was the program back then. There was no IA uh, undergrad program. Otherwise, I would have taken it. Uh, grad school, I did do the IA concentration under the, um, I don't know, whatever degree I got. Let's get, Yeah, let's go with that. Um, so I did those. Uh, I also, uh, I don't know what course numbers they are. The, the two Linux classes, maybe there's more these days. I don't know. Uh, but they were in NIDA 2.12 and 4.12 back in the day. Um, I salvaged those from some poor, poor uh, people that had done a very bad job with them when I was a student and uh, taught those for about two years. Um, and then subsequently, I think if you've taken them recently-ish, uh, Alan Edwards or Steve Edwards may have taught you, uh, both of which are good friends of mine. I went to undergrad with them, lived with Steve Edwards, and, and long, long tenure with the Edwards brothers. Um, so now I'm at Rapid7, um, we'll talk, I'm sure, incidentally about career stuff as we go a little bit. Um, this is definitely an interactive thing. I don't know how long these slides are, I haven't given this deck in two years, I don't know if the deck's even relevant. We'll figure it out together, we'll have fun, you're here on a Friday, all bets are off. So, um, and of course in every slide there is some sort of animated GIF, which at the very least you can laugh at if you don't like me. <laughs> so, uh, and that's how any career is, but InfoSec especially. Uh, so we're going to talk about career in InfoSec. Um, if you haven't seen the website before, Security Reactions, Tumblr, my friend uh, Kelly, or Aloria, as she's known online, runs it. It's hilarious. You should submit content to it. Um, again, please ask questions, chat. We can go on tangents all night. It doesn't matter. Just do, you know, do whatever feels right. And then otherwise, email, Twitter. I'll get you all that at the end. I'm very easy to track down based on Google and stuff. Um, so we'll start with Grinch as a warm-up. So in terms of information security, um, and I, I will very openly say there are certain things I'm going to say that will go against what Eastern Michigan might like me to say, but I don't work for the fucking university, so what do I care? Um, there, there are some things that you are probably going to figure out at some point in your career, one of which is being in information security as a career does not have to start with a job in information security. Uh, and very practically, that's actually probably the better way to go. So while a lot of you, or all of you, probably are in a degree for information security, um, as you see fit, I would recommend to do jobs that are not in InfoSec. Whether it's your first job, your second job, your third job, try to get into being a sysadmin, being a network engineer, developing code for a living. Um, those skills, those perspectives, those points of view are not something you can fake. They are not something that you can manufacture later in life. You cannot uh, empathize enough with someone that you haven't done a job like they're doing. So when you're going through and you're breaking code and you're laughing because you're so elite and you're breaking code and look, I'm finding exploit or find vulnerabilities and exploiting them in your, your web app, unless you've ever developed a web app, you really don't know how that feels. You don't know how to actually um, uh, interact with someone where you are basically taking their career and laughing at them. And that doesn't feel good. And so unless you know how to feel that way and, and how to approach those conversations, um, you're going to step on some toes. And a lot of InfoSec is humility. A lot of InfoSec is learning to interact with people in a positive manner. Um, there's a lot of pressure on, uh, I think, students, especially in, in programs like IA or InfoSec programs proper, to go into like ethical hacking. Ethical hacking is a career path. That's the career path. That's the career path you need to go down. That's the path you should go down. Um, I don't think that's true uh, for a variety of reasons, many of which we'll cover today. The other thing is when you, if, if you pivot from, let's say you've been a sysadmin or network engineer for two or three years, right? You pivot, you meet, you know, meet up against someone who themselves only has done security, has only done offensive security or blue teaming or 
you know, pick your world of, of security. Um, again, when you get them in a room and you stand the two next to each other and you start talking shop, the person who breaks security understands what broken security looks like. The person who builds security understands what, hopefully, what good security looks like and broken security looks like. They have both sides of the equation. So for instance, web apps, right? One of the things that I'm sure you learned somewhere in, in the curriculum would be like something like SQL injection, okay? You will very easily learn how to find SQL injection. You will very easily learn how to use things like SQL map and automate SQL injection. Um, to know how to defend against SQL injection in the various languages that people write in with the various frameworks they write in. Um, if you don't know what stored procedures are, if you don't know what parameterized queries are, if you don't know what placeholder queries are, if you don't know abstraction libraries for databases for programming languages, when you get into a room with a developer and you say, stuff sucks, it doesn't work, it's, it's you know, vulnerable to SQL injection, they're going to say, okay, what next? And you're going to go, I don't, I don't know, I just learned how to break stuff. I never learned how to build anything. Um, and so if you have someone that has been a developer or has been a network engineer or sysadmin, they're going to be able to bring both sides of that equation together, and that's valuable to an employer, right? You're not just getting the break and you're also getting the building, you're getting perspective that, again, you can't really make up. Um, so it's, it's very popular, like I said, like to believe that there's only this one path and that's become an ethical hacker and own things and break things. And um, there's, there's a much larger crew out, crew out there for many of you beyond that. The, well, we'll skip that part, we just kind of covered that. Um, tools is another thing uh, that I'm very, very, very sour on. Uh, there's a lot of emphasis on how to use tools, and tools are great. Tools are great when you know how to already do the thing the tool does. Tools are bad when you don't know how to do the thing the tool does. So again, if you take SQL injection, for instance, because that's what the world runs on basically in security, you take SQL injection, and maybe you can throw like a you know, uh, a single quote in, in, a, in a parameter in a query. And you see, oh, there's an error for MySQL. Well, may, maybe there's SQL injection. Well, there is SQL injection. Whether it's something that you can own or not is another question, but there's SQL injection. And so now you go through the process of passing it through SQL map, setting up some parameters, you know, it's like two or three command line parameters, and you basically come back five minutes later and you've got your example POC for SQL injection. That's great until you meet some code that SQL map doesn't know how to exploit. And it's not that it's impossible to exploit, but you have to keep in mind any tool has a finite number of, of, of uh, now, you know, whether it's signature based, whether it's error prone, whether it's blind, there are only a finite number of ways to actually have a piece of program without machine learning actually go, oh, there's a vulnerability here and this is how you exploit it. It's gonna go, oh, this doesn't look like all the other like thousand things I was programmed against must not be vulnerable. And if you take a tool's word for it without actually knowing how to go through the steps, guess what? You're gonna miss vulnerabilities and you're gonna be bad at your job ultimately. Um, so spend more time learning how to break stuff. Once you understand how to break stuff and or build stuff, then automate what you're doing, right? Um, <clears throat> the other thing, and I, I, I gave a, a, a keynote at Converge, the security conference in Detroit, um, I don't know, two months ago or whatever it was. One of the points I had there was the, the demand for people in InfoSec is huge. You all, you all know that. Some of you might be in this industry because the demand's so huge, right? Um, the demand's huge, and you know, getting a four-year degree with a focus in something like information insurance is a, a, a giant you know, leg up on most people, right? Keep in mind, though, that you might have students that are not in an IA program. But what they might be in, they might be in a comp sci program. They might be in a network engineering program. They might be in some other program that, again, gives them a leg up over you. Because if I sit an IA student down that knows how to run Metasploit really well, and I have a comp sci student that knows what assembly is and how it works and how to find uh, and exploit issues with assembly, guess who's probably going to get hired, right? So don't hang your hat on the fact that you're really good with tools. Don't hang your hat on the fact that you uh, you, you took something like damn vulnerable um, Linux and, and or damn vulnerable web app damn well, Linux too, um, and you can break all those little challenges. CTFs are awesome. By, by all means, any CTF you can participate in, if for nothing else, the enjoyment of working with people, as cliche and bad as that sounds, that's the reality. Every time you get a team project, you go, team projects are dumb. The whole career you will have ahead of you is all team projects. So if you don't like team projects, something else might want to be in your future. Um, 
So keep, keep that in mind. Keep in mind that the tools are going to get better and the automation of tools are going to get better such that you might not actually be in the middle between the tool and the output of the tool anymore. Okay. So um, as an example, coming up next year at DEF CON, uh, they previewed it this year, uh, Jordan Weens and some other people um, are putting together a machine only CTF. So they have built, and, and there was a whole competition the last couple of years to like build these, these things out. They're all machine learning based. They're all autonomous. Big, big rack of computing power, underlying logic and programming. They get a binary. The computer gets a binary. It goes in, and then the computer not only finds vulnerabilities in the binary, but does actual, effectively live patching to exploit that vulnerability. Okay, so when you think of something like a buffer overflow, these machines, and they've, they've demoed them, it's not all, you know, it's not fake, this is real stuff. Um, they've demoed them that it can actually do that, and that's technology from last year, and guess how quick technology moves, right? It's quick. So next year at DEF CON, there will be an uh, entire, I think it's like a two or three day event, just on, I think it's six teams total that qualified, with that computing power to automate a CTF. So... Uh, again, tools are great. You can learn a lot from building tools and working with tools, but understand the underlying principles um, because if you don't, you're going to miss stuff. And um, that works both ways too. Don't think just because you know how to do one thing, you might not want to use a tool to have coverage. You know, you talk, when in development, we talk about a lot of uh, things like code coverage when it comes to like unit testing or security testing, code coverage. Uh, I've done pen tests where I looked at a form and I tested it manually and I was like, oh, there's no like vulnerability here, no big deal. And I'm like, I'll just throw like one of my favorite web app security tools at it. And sure enough, all the things I checked were fine. They, they weren't vulnerable. The one thing I didn't check was a drop down list in a web app and that drop down list in the web app that had a code execution problem. But I didn't check it because it was a drop down and I was lazy and I was only working with Burp Suite on certain things and blah, blah, blah. So um, it goes both ways. Uh, learn both, but definitely understand the principles of what you're doing, uh, not just how to do it. Uh, InfoSec overall, if, um, let's see how I want to phrase this in a somewhat polite way. Um, InfoSec has a lot of potential to make you a lot of money. Not all InfoSec jobs will make you a lot of money, okay? Um, so when we're talking about something like being a penetration tester, a penetration testing job for the most part, is really just a commodity job today, okay? Penetration testing is a known quantity. The, 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 there's, a, the, there's a penetration testing standard now, PTES. There are plenty of tools like Metasploit that Rapid7 owns and makes and all that good stuff. There's a lot of good stuff out there to make people that don't know even anything about computers be able to break into systems and pivot and, and traverse networks and do lateral movement. You don't even have to be good at computers anymore to do that kind of stuff. So the question becomes, where, where's, where's you know, kind of the, the big career kind of moves uh, going to be? A lot of it falls into management, right? You might be a pen tester for five years, six years, seven years. Um, if you're good at what you do and you're a personal person and you can do presentations and all this kind of stuff, you will probably be asked to go into management. The reason why is because 90 out of 100 people, or I guess I could... Slim that down to 9 out of 10. Uh, nine, 9 out of 10 people are not that person. 9 out of 10 people cannot do that. They do not have those traits. They are not the person that management wants in a room at a Fortune 500 company talking about how you got broken in last week. Okay? You need to be the person that stands in the room, gives the presentations, builds the slide decks, writes well, conveys information you need to convey in a timely manner, and be efficient at it. So that's kind of one reality. Um, the The... Overall idea here is that information security skills and talents, while you might start by doing um, you know, code exploitation or doing uh, blue teaming or doing X, Y, or Z, you can pivot out of those things. Um, the, the greatest harm you can do to yourself is stick to one thing and be like, I'm so good at this one thing. Guess what? That one thing could go away tomorrow, right? Uh, we see this happen all the time. So go back in time a long time. Um, back in high school, I did... Just at the start, they used to have the, or they still do, I'm sure, you know, the, the uh, Cisco CCNA academies. Maybe some of you, you did them uh, in school. And so in high school, I did one. And the book I got was the very last book that had Novell Netware Administration as part of the concentration. And reasonably so, a lot of you probably have never heard of Novell Netware. 
you don't need to know about Noville Network. The reason why it's gone, basically. A couple places still use it. It's going to live forever in some places, sure. But overall, it's not used, okay? You know, AD for the most part, and then some other solutions like ping identity and blah, blah, blah. Um, so there is a whole pool, a very large pool of people out there that have spent their entire career as Novell network administrators. And they had to pick up 20 years of experience and learn something new in a market that is not very friendly to people of a certain age. Okay, um, uh, age Ageism in technology is a very real thing. And you will hit a point where, you're, where you will start interviewing people that are 40, 50 years old and being like, I don't know if we really want you on our team. You know, we just got out of college. We kind of know things you don't know. It, it's real life. Like people will treat you like that at a certain age. And the question is, are you talented enough and broadly skilled enough to pivot jobs when, when the market dictates? Just think of how many people have been Flash developers for a lot of their career and all we spend time doing is patching Flash exploits now um, or vulnerabilities rather. And how many of those people that have been doing Flash for the last 15 years are like, wow, Flash is probably going to die like any minute now if it already hasn't. Uh, and they have to learn a whole new career now. So pivot, be ready, um, do like this guy and be awesome, smack people in the face. I'm going to watch that again. Boom. Um, so here's a short list. And I, I, I generally, genuinely do mean a short list. Um, so number one is the number one people, or the number one thing people usually think of. The trick here is, and hopefully you are looking at other courses beyond just your IA courses as important because your other courses are also very important. Uh, so math, for instance, right? Uh, cryptography. If you're not paying attention to the news right now, uh, a lot of crazy things are going on with cryptography. And it's not so much that you need to yourself be a cryptographer, but to understand things like Diffie-Hellman 1024-bit uh, and understanding like primitives of uh, uh, prime number factoring. Just knowing those things alone will give you a leg up on the people in the room with you. Uh, so a lot of value there. Security analyst is a very common position. Maybe, you know, some of you might already be doing security analyst type work. Some of you might be aspiring to do that. Um, you know, effectively, security analyst is the person that's going to be going through systems and understanding logs, looking at alerts, looking at events, triaging them up the chain, trying to determine if an incident's underway, all those kinds of things. Like that's what an analyst effect effectively does. Um, there's, of course, a lot of creativity in that role. There's a lot of understanding how to do reporting, how to do database manipulation, how to uh, build reports that are high value, high signal, um, and low noise. And that's not, you know, again, the tool will do a lot for you, but unless you aren't that person who wants to dive in to hundreds of thousands of bits of data a day, security analyst work probably won't, you know, play out very well. Right, right, take a seat, you're being rude. Um, so, there you go. Uh, closer. Yeah, always closer. Um, security architecture is <laughs> hostile work environment. Uh, security architecture. Now, this this means a lot, and and it's vague in, intentionally. Um, the reason why, and I'm, quite honestly, a lot of the work I do now for Rapid Seven really falls almost more into the security architecture than any of these other things, which means that. You know, I go into an organization, and not small, like, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars, like, multi-billion dollar organizations weekly, depending on my travel schedule. Um, and I look top to bottom, left to right, how they are doing information security for their program. These are publicly traded companies. These are critical infrastructure, hazardous recycling, um, uh, universities, uh, manufacturing, all kinds of stuff, right? All kinds of organizations. And we basically understand how their organization is built the technologies that sustain it, the type of people that operate within it, and the, the, the needs of the business. Um, so again, all these business classes that you might have to take as general electives, that is all gold, and you should be taking that more seriously almost in some of your IA classes probably. Um, doing things like SWOT analysis, discovery documents, business plans, that all factors in hugely into actually getting like real work done at the end of the day. Uh, a couple other ones, uh, policy, and we'll kind of combine the standard uh, standard regulation, auditing, and policy. So there's a whole other area of information security that usually gets left off the like, oh, this is kind of boring stuff, uh, or add, added to the boring stuff list and not on the cool list. And that's unfortunate because policy development and being, um, you know, being an auditor with like Deloitte or PwC, going in and actually understanding organizations, understanding enough technology to be beneficial and useful, um, you can make a boatload of money being an auditor. 
Uh, and again, this is all people skills. This is all attention to detail. This is the minutia that your other maybe uh, classmates don't want to spend time on. This is where you can excel if you know you like me are OCD as hell and you enjoy going through you know bulleted lists of, of hundreds of thousands of things and trying to find the uh, signal noise to their uh, to that ratio as well. Uh, and then basic things, systems administrators uh, or systems engineers, network engineers. Um, but again, short list of things. I have no idea why two years ago I picked this this image for this one. Just go with it. I will. Um, kind of what I was saying before about uh, Brad, you missed my Novell Netware uh, segue. Yeah. Um, so again, if you have one career path, you're probably going to need another career path one day. Um, <laughs> just realistically, you know, having one career for uh, or one IT centric or security centric career for your entire career probably is not going to happen. Okay, uh, technology is going to change. You might be in a job where you have a great, you know, great pay, great coworkers, great environment, and one day you'll wake up and the company gets sold, or you have layoffs, or you have to move, or uh, you know there's some some reason why you have to change jobs, and that really good paying job might not be that important in a market you're in now. Or it might not be something that people are looking for anymore. So be ready for that and, and prepare yourself for that. Don't be caught off guard and be like, oh, it's so unfair that, you know, I was a really good net, you know, network admin with uh, Juniper and Juniper got sold 15 years ago, but I didn't do anything about it. I just kind of kept going with Juniper. Um, you know, be ready for that and, and uh, you know, adapt and overcome, as the uh, military says. Um, Jack of all trades is a slippery slope. Um, I, for if you look at my resume, would be definitely considered jack of all trades. I've been an actual, like, pay my mortgage, been an actual web developer, I've been a sysadmin, I've been a te pen tester, I've done program development, which is why I do at Rabbit7, I've worked at help desks, I, I've done everything, okay? Um, in those roles, I did the best I could and did, you know, a, a, a pretty good job with, with, with what I did. You want to be proficient enough to get your job done without hand-holding, but if you're going to be a jack-of-all-trades, like, you're going to have some trade-offs there. You're not going to get into some of the, like, really sticky, down-and-dirty details of certain things. You're just not. You don't have time to do it. Um, you can have one thing that you're really good at and then some ancillary things that you kind of fill in gaps with. And um, so, again, don't, don't uh, again, put all your eggs in one basket, but also try to find some proficiency so that you're not just kind of the person that kind of knows the stuff, but can't actually do the job. That's a bad place to be in as well. There's been a lot of attention, just like penetration testing, with people that want to be social engineers. Everyone thinks social engineers is going to be the coolest thing in the world, and it's going to be so fun, and I want to, you know, I want to go around and pretend to be people and try to break into places. And um, yeah, it's a lot of fun. And, and the reality is, for most people in most career paths, you will do, in, in like pen testing and some other things, you will do some social engineering. For most people, you will not have a full-time job as a social engineer, okay? There are very few jobs in that. Part of why, A, it's really hard to be awesome at it. Um, Jen Fox, who's a local person in this area, she just won the black badge at DEF CON for the uh, social engineering CTF. Um, she does do on-site pen tests, and she does do social engineering, but she still actually doesn't do that full-time. And she is, to some arguable degree, like one of the best people in the world, at social engineering. But she uses it every day. She uses it every day. And all of you will probably use social engineering every day to some extent. Um, but you know, keep, keep, keep in mind, like, don't, it's, it's good to aspire to something, it's good to dream, it's good to have passions. But don't let that, like, obscure your vision of the fact that you need to be a usable employee and not just dream job focused, right? You can do social engineering 50% of your time, 75% of your time, but you're still probably not going to have a job where all you do is pick up the phone and try to be like the help desk employee from Fortune 5 company. You're, it's just not probably going to happen. There's a cute dog. I want that dog. <clears throat> um, now, most people that you will talk to in their career will say that their industry is stressful. Uh, and I, I don't doubt that, right? Like, there's a lot of industries that are generally very stressful. There are a lot of industries that are more stressful than information security. Uh, information security, however, can be extremely stressful depending on what you're doing. Uh, now, all the, excuse me, all the general business reasons all apply, all the things that you can probably assume. But keep in mind that if you're a pen tester 
and you're doing actual real life pen tests. There is real life business data. There are real actual accounts serving or, you know, a purpose. There are um, servers that cannot go down. There is critical infrastructure tied to a network that probably shouldn't be tied to it. These things happen all the time. And the difference between someone that can open up Metasploit or run Nexpos or Nessus and find vulnerabilities uh, and the person that can do that a stealthily so that people don't necessarily know you're there uh, and B that you don't break stuff that is fragile. That is a really, really good person for that role. Um, spray and pray attack, you know, uh, ideas and processes are not something that will keep you in a career very long. Information security, when you start getting into InfoSec in like a really um, formal way, very small community. Um, there are people that I can list names off of, of people that are effectively blacklisted from doing certain jobs in InfoSec. And that goes left to right, up, down, everywhere in between for the people that are hiring managers for the companies you want to work for. I, someone here or more than one pe person here is, uh, I guess, working for Target soon. I know a lot of people at Target, and they know a lot of people that I know, and vice versa, out and out and out across the U.S. and even across the world. And so if you are that person that does a SQL injection attack and you type in the wrong command and you actually do a cascade delete rather than a select, you probably won't have a job very long, and that's going to follow you for a lot of your career. Um, now, keep in mind, the, one of the reasons you're in college is to learn really practical, useful ways to avoid that, right? You're learning how to use things the right way. You're learning uh, principles that are important to not have these scenarios. But, you know, keep in mind, like, just like doctors make mistakes and everyone else makes mistakes, you will probably make mistakes. Just hopefully they won't be big ones. Um, so you won't ever, you know, just accidentally do... <laughs> Anything wrong, right? I like how he just freezes. I don't think there's any better reaction to that other than run. Um, so um, uh, I really, really miss uh, Parks and Rec. Uh, never say no to Panda. If you haven't seen those, Google never say no to Panda on, on or look on YouTube, I guess. Um, so I mean, like, honestly, like, there are, and we'll we'll see more of this in a second, but like, Day in, day out, you are doing stuff that will not work. You are doing a lot of things that have no functional benefit. You are doing things that will not get you into a system or it won't get you into the next system you need to get into. Um, while there are certain engagements, if you are a pen tester, for instance, that you'll go on and be just like, you're in, you're done, it's over. There is going to be a lot that aren't going to be like that. It's going to be very frustrating. You're going to have a lot of late nights. Um, these numbers, of course, are... Day, you know, day-to-day -day and engagement to engagement, but overall, I mean, reporting is a huge part. In fact, I probably should have gave more than 20%. Um, reporting is a huge, huge, huge part of your time doing offensive security. Um, you know, it's not just like, got into system, got domain admin. Like, <laughs> you're writing entire narratives about the process you took, the OSINT you did, the data you gathered, the, the network uh, path you traversed, the lateral movement you achieved, the credentials you stole, the uh, vulnerabilities you found, how you exploited them, what code you wrote. It's a very involved process to do a pen test report the right way. Um, calls and emails, you have clients. You are now in a client business in most security jobs. You have someone outside of your boss that you are beholden to to say whether or not you did a good job. And those clients, they want communication, uh, sometimes a little too much communication. <laughs> Um, and then keeping in mind that while hacking, which involves a lot of things, and that's obviously a big bubble for a reason, um, reconnaissance is a lot of it before you ever get your window to actually do an engagement, because whether you like it or not, um, most things are very curated when it comes to offensive security. Most of them are like, you can only pen test us between this hour and this hour. And then you'll have scoping, which is a whole other fun part of uh, offensive security, where they're like, well, we know that's a really attractive target to break into, but we don't want you to test it. Okay, great. Uh, you just took away like a huge benefit to this that a real attacker would totally do, but yeah, I won't do it. No big deal. Um, so a lot of it's reconnaissance. A lot of it's, uh, you know, going on Google, trying to find information, directories, if you're doing social engineering as part of the engagement. And one thing to keep in mind as well, uh, a company I used to work for in Ann Arbor when I did pen testing for a couple years, they do not do engagements with social engineering. They do not sell engagements with social engineering. What does that mean if you're doing an external pen test? That means you have a dozen IPs externally facing and maybe two or three services and you have to spend about a week trying to figure out how to get into one of those. 
okay? You do not just send a phishing email and hope for credentials. You do not send a phishing email with some flash malware and, and, and get a interpreter shell. You have to actually break into the company, okay? This isn't just picking the lowest common denominator. And that will happen whether your company <coughs> does it or doesn't do it. The actual person hiring you may also make that a restriction. So if you're getting really, really good at Cobalt Strike or, or Armitage or something and doing some of this, remember that that might not be the reality of the job you have. Uh, certifications is a, is a, is a tricky one. Um, I, I've, I've been very vocal, in fact, at Converge about people just either going way too far one way or going way too far the other way. So, oh my God. <laughs> oh. Good to see you. We're, uh, we're only about four years late for that lunch. I know. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, so you have you have certifications. Um, how many people have a certification of some sort? Not necessarily InfoSec. Okay. How many of you have a planned certification you want to get in the next year? Okay. So pretty good handful. Um, there are certifications that you will get to prove that you are passionate, quite frankly. Okay. Uh, a lot of certifications are not that hard to pass if you know what you're, what you're going to do. Like if you just sit someone down at a test, yeah, they're going to fail. But if you're at all involved in something like InfoSec, uh, especially like a four-year degree, getting a CISSP or getting a Security Plus or something, pretty simple overall, actually. Um, it, 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 it'll be something that you're engrossed in the content, you understand the content, you understand how and the whys and all that stuff. Once you have your foot in the door in InfoSec, your career will be built on you. Your career will be maybe supplemented by a cert uh, certification every so often. If you get a certification after you have your career started, you've had you know work experience for a couple of years, um, the only reason you'll probably get a cert uh, certification is one, if your employer requires requires it, or two, if a client requires it. Okay, um, because really, realistically, what's it going to prove other than that you're already doing the job that you're getting a certification for? Very, very little. Um, so it's a great foot in the door if you if you're planning to do like OCSP or OSCP. Yeah. So there's this thing called an OCSP responder for certificate authorities, and it always ruins me. Um, if you're thinking about doing that, really involved process, right? You learn a lot, a lot of hands-on. It is a great learning experience. You should totally do it if you're looking to get a certification. Uh, CISSP. There was some stat I had in uh, my slide deck at Converge that said something like, uh, let's say 2013 or something. There were I think it was like um, it was like net like forty thousand jobs in the U.S. that needed a CISSP, and there are literally not that many. Like they they ran out of CISSPs in the entire pool of CISSPs. There were still like forty thousand more people needed. Okay, so there's a lot of good ways and a lot of advantages getting a certification. Um, I have people that I've worked with that have I'm not even kidding like three dozen certifications, and it's just there are worse vices. <laughs> I don't know. Beer's a lot tastier than certifications, man. Um, there, you know, there's there's a lot of, of benefit to things you can use your money on. If now, if you're your, let's say your employer is like, oh, we'll pay for any cert you want, but we won't pay for training, or we won't pay for X, or we won't pay for Y. Sometimes you can get very creative with a, a budget like that and be like, oh, well, uh, you won't pay for training, but my certification requires that I do a training course before I can get it. Like. So, um, you know, work, work within the politics of your organization. Maybe that's a means to an end where you want training, but the certification is a way to, like, get them to sign off on it. So, um, two points here. One, certifications do not make people experts. And please, 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 unless you're the person that created it or wrote a book on it or something else, do not put expert, okay? Um, I, I take a great sense of like really sadistic pride, and I'm not saying I'm a good person, but if I see expert on a resume, I will pick out the most obscure bullshit that you can ever imagine about a topic. Um, there was a person when I was uh, I was a, a, a Linux admin uh, like five or six years or six or seven years ago, and someone came in and we we actually hired him. He's a good guy and good at what he does, but he put down he was a cryptography expert. Um, I used to run a cryptography-based company. One of my friends was a cryptographer for Ford and NIST. I know way too much about random crypto stuff no one cares about. So I asked him every question I could, and he just stood there and was pissed off. It was great. <laughs> um, so, you know, keep, keep in mind, like, experts, there are experts in this world. And if you say you're an expert, be ready to prove it. 
Otherwise, you'll have a grumpy cat. Um, so same idea as before. Uh, try to actually break it before you automate that break. Um, you know, if you find, let's say you find uh, cross-site scripting or you find CSERF or you find SQL injection in a web app, for instance, find it, test it, understand it, and then automate the rest because guess what? If there's one cross-site scripting, there's probably a thousand cross-site scripting, right? Don't, don't waste your time, but go through the hurdles to actually find stuff because if you run tools, you're going to miss stuff every single time. Um, same thing, uh, custom exploit, whether it's a buffer overflow, whether it's uh, injection, if it's local file inclusion, whatever it might be, there are a lot of cool tools that will do a lot of things for you. Um, don't rely on them. Um, are you guys making a ESXi lab or something for testing? Is that what I heard? Yeah, uh, cool. for our practice environment for CCDC and ISDS. Awesome. Um, we've got two ESXi servers on it. Really well, that's more than some giant corporations I work with, so congratulations. Um, <laughs> So uh, you have, and this is like one of many, Pentest Lab in general will, will get you stuff to look at. Um, there are countless vulnerability uh, or VM-based um, vulnerability kind of like labs and things that I'm sure you're all more familiar with than I am even at this point. The other thing is um, a huge, huge, huge area for your benefit uh, because A, it's free. B, it gets you in actual industry experience. C, it can do great <coughs> things for networking for your career. Uh, and D, it shows way more passion than breaking challenges that have already been broken and put intentionally into code that was made broken. Go on GitHub. Go on SourceForge. Go on Google Code if that still exists. Actually, if SourceForge still exists, um, buy a thread. Uh, go on Bitbucket. How oh, that's more relevant. Uh, go on these services. Look for a code base that you're comfortable with. So maybe it's C, uh, maybe it's Java, maybe it's PHP, whatever. Look around for apps. Um, and I won't, I, maybe I won't come up with a number, but there's a really good chance that if you start looking at open source code from especially like smaller projects, I'm not talking like giant corporation projects necessarily off, off the bat, but smaller projects people put on GitHub or something, you will probably find vulnerabilities. And then you can report vulnerabilities. You can uh, get a CVE. How many people know what a CVE is? So uh, CVE stands for Common Vulnerabilities and Exposures. CVE is a program that was established by MITRE, uh, which is another thing you might want to take a look at, um, to basically uniquely identify a given vulnerability. So these days, again, because this happened back in like early thousands and late 90s, um, these days we give everything a really fun name for a vulnerability, right? That's fine. I'm not, I'm not necessarily opposed to that. But canonically, uh, a named vulnerability, a named vulnerability like in the media, might actually in fact be about a dozen vulnerabilities behind the covers. And each of those individual vulnerabilities will get assigned a CVE ID. And that way you always have a historical reference to say, oh, that bug, CVE 20, 2015, um, you know, 1279 or something. Um, so you can start getting those. You can put those on your resume. You can work with the vendors to actually go through the disclosure process and get bugs fixed. You can work with them to patch their own software. If you know how to do software development, you can say, here's what I found, here's why it's broken, and here's how to fix it. And if you're looking at open source repositories, like for instance, um, Netflix, uh, Square, um, other companies I'm blanking on right now, take, it, take my word for it, um, there are very cool companies that you might want to work for and they have a ton of open source software on GitHub right now. And if you can find one bug in one of those projects, you are gonna be a very popular person for that internship you really wanted. Mm. Uh, relevant, always relevant, more and more relevant in my life these days. Um, so I do a lot of uh, Internet of Things security research, um, and that first question, have an IP camera on your network, uh, uh, like three years ago now or something, I was looking for a Raspberry Pi on my home network. I did an Nmap across my network to find it because I forgot what IP it was uh, DHCP'd for. And I found my IP camera was running Telnet. And I was like, well, that's weird. Um, and that one happenstance opportunity to find a really weird thing on my network led me to a research project that I've spoken in Amsterdam for, I've spoken in South Korea for, I've been on the news, I've done all kinds of crazy things. That one project started that whole wave to the point where I'm at now. I mean, honestly, like that little project that I thought was just fun because it was my camera in my house, um, there's a very hot market for research. And the cool thing about research, especially like uh, IoT research right now, there are thousands and thousands and thousands of devices. A lot of them are like 100 bucks or less. 
you can break stuff, you can uh, buy stuff off eBay, and you find one or two cool bugs, you publish that in a report, again, your internship might be on its way for you. So spend some time trying to like break stuff, just have fun. Um, if you know much about electronics or, or know someone that does, get a hold of them. There's a lot of um, a, a electrical kind of needs in some of this uh, work, but good time to pair up with other people at the COT and similar. Um, if your company is a little bit more mature, maybe they have a security team or maybe your development team doesn't have a security team or security pro uh, uh, kind of processes in place, you know, tell them about the OWASP top 10, help them automate code testing for security, run web application scanners with their permission against the code bases for that organization. Again, you might actually be making a career for yourself for a job rec they didn't even know they needed. Uh, friends and family is always good. Uh, a lot of a lot of opportunities, um, and of course, the more you network, the more people you um, you know go through this program with. I, you know, I, I won't say I'm, I'm I guess I'm shocked, but the number of students when I used to teach here that I still meet up with at a conference once in a while, or I run into in Ann Arbor or something if I'm hanging out there, and they're like, "Oh, I'm so and so at GE now. I'm so and so at Blue Cross Blue Shield. I'm so and so at whatever." Like. Um, I mean, I didn't come out of college, and, and I, I, wasn't, I wasn't as successful as most of the students I had a few years ago were. Uh, Eastern Michigan has one of the best programs, not in the state, but in the country, um, and you are actually learning a lot of valuable information. The question is, are you going to really benefit from it by doing stuff like this while you're in college and have all of the free time in the world? Or are you going to wait until you're out of college, you're working 60 hours a week, and you have no time or interest to put another 20 in? So while you're an undergrad, please go ahead and do some of this stuff. Um, You'll, uh, you'll be better. You already know about ISTS. Is DC3 still a thing? No, it's not. All right, ignore that one. Um, this just happened, unfortunately. Uh, did anyone participate in Seesaw, the CTF stuff? OK. So Seesaw, uh, CTF, um, obviously Seesaw is a thing. But Poly uh, in New York actually puts together a CTF competition every year. There's an open quals round, and then there's an actual, like, um, whatever, not quals round. Um, and easily one of my favorite CTFs, period. Just Every, every year, awesome content. Uh, some of the best security researchers in the world actually give challenges to it. It's a very well done competition. Um, I, you know, I saw this and I kind of froze for a second. Does anyone know something wrong with this image? Any sports fans? Anyone read the news? Lamar Odom. Uh, yeah, yeah. I almost took that out. Um, did he? He said hi. Yeah, oh good. Um, uh, so I think the interesting thing is the, um, and, th and this, I, I really think this is like just a, you know, even a few years kind of thing. So like, let me, let me, for instance, say like when I was an undergrad and I had my laptop, um, I could run maybe one VM on my laptop without it dying. Like most of you on your computers can run like a dozen Linux VMs at one time and not even like break a sweat, right? Um, labs were not a thing that people had like ready access to. There weren't really VMs that were made to break and hack on and, and find vulns in. Um, there were some online competitions that did a little bit of that, but the amount of content you have to go through and learn from is just like amazing. It's, just, it's, it's absolutely amazing. And then you throw in like cloud computing, the fact you could spin up an EC2 instance and have an environment to test it. Like there's no, there's literally no limit to what you have in terms of access. Like as, as Wikipedia is to our knowledge today, so is like all of these awesome VM environments that you can actually break and hack. Um, so this kind of stuff isn't that big of a problem because like honestly, if you're like breaking things randomly, like just breaking things randomly, it's probably because you need more focus or you lost your focus. Um, like I said, buy something, break it at your house. That's pretty awesome. Um, uh, humility, I started with this uh, at the start of the talk. I'll say it again. If you follow information security people on Twitter, you will very quickly see humility is dead. Um, there, is, there is a lot of elitism. There's a lot of um, self-promotion. There's a lot of uh, branding of security people. It's a very interesting industry if you haven't been looking yet. You will notice it eventually. Uh, again, try to be humble. Uh, the amount of stuff I thought I knew like in high school or in college, uh, every single year, and this applies to life in general, quite frankly, but every single year, if you don't feel like you were an idiot the year before, you probably aren't working hard enough. Uh, every single year I go, man, I was dumb. Oh, my, I can't believe I thought that. Oh, I, was, I wasted so much time. Um, 
there's a lot of things to learn. The industry changes constantly. Technology changes constantly. Um, you can't do enough to keep uh, continuing, you know, continuing education. So whether it's you know going for a graduate degree, whether it's doing trainings, whether it's uh, coming to industry events and going to conferences and participating in giving talks, there's so much more that you have to do after this all ends. Um, uh, don't say you know how to ha hack. Just don't say it because hacking isn't a like it's not a it's a nebulous thing, right? Okay, I hacked something. Okay, did you like? add a glowing little like LED on it? Did you hardware hack? Or did you hardware hack by opening it up, dumping flash, and then reverse engineering a binary, right? Hacking something doesn't really mean that much. Um, there's a lot of, there's a lot of people that are more focused on the hacker culture than they are on the infosec profession. Focus on the profession, the culture stuff's always there. You don't have to do anything or talk any certain way. Focus on the career part, uh, the rest is kind of just hanging out. Um, I miss her. Uh, so a couple other things, general, and there's a whole another list of, of sites uh, that I probably could give you if you want to email me or something. Um, uh, again, things like knowing about the most recent paper out of mostly uh, University of Michigan students, by the way, um, on the Diffie-Hellman uh, prime situation that we're facing with uh, some interesting implications. Um, that kind of information or the fact that, uh, you know, there was another Adobe Zero Day vulnerability that a patch just came out this afternoon for. Um, these are things to keep abreast of and understand and know about. And these are the kinds of conversations that if you're on a job interview and you start rambling off like the current events and the concerns and you start going down a line of, well, you know, it's interesting about, you know, Flash because there's these mitigations that Google's Project Zero team helped actually put in, but the newest zero day actually isn't impacted by those and it actually works around those mitigations. But if you use something like Microsoft's Emmet on top of that, you could actually harden the system so that even if there's a zero day, it won't impact the system, right? A couple words I just said there, maybe you've never heard of, that's okay. The important part is you need to understand what is happening right now, especially if you're in offensive security, well, especially if you're in defensive security too, right? You have to know what you're looking for in those logs. Um, that's all very important and you have to stay on top of it every single day. Uh, mailing lists like full disclosure or bug track, get on the mailing list, whether it's in your RSS feed or whether it's actually a mailing list that you subscribe to, understand what's happening, what the chatter's like, who's involved. And again, yes, there's a lot of hubris in InfoSec. There's a lot of idiots on Twitter, uh, but there's a ton of great content that you will not see literally anywhere else other than Twitter. Uh, InfoSec and Twitter are joined at the hip, for better or for worse. Um, you don't have to be part of Twitter. You can still look at Twitter. Uh, and just like Edward Norton Fight Club, so just we're gonna watch him turn around and look creepy. Good. Um, uh, other things, and these are all still relevant, luckily. Uh, we can add Converge uh, Detroit, or Converge actually just to the list. So B-Size Detroit and Converge. Um, uh, Converge is kind of a full uh, two-day event. B-Size Detroit is a one-day event these days. And uh, that'll be sometime in the summer-ish, I think July, end of July this year, I want to say. Uh, Secure World Detroit just happened. That happens usually in Dearborn. Um, again, right around the fall, September, October. Uh, Gurkhan just happened. All these important things that hopefully someone else knew about here. Um, uh, MySec, which is actually a, a group I started back at the first B-side, so that's been, what, five years. Uh, ARPSEC, very local to all of you. It's actually in Ar Ann Arbor, as the name kind of implies. Uh, ARPSEC's kind of the, I would say, more networking side of the equation. Um, we some, sometimes have talks, sometimes don't. Uh, usually there's beer and pizza and hanging out and just chatting and bullshitting, which is good too, right? Like, again, networking's networking. Uh, Motor City ISSA, which I was just speaking at last night, um, that's just in Livonia at the uh, Schoolcraft um, uh, Vista Tech Center. And that's, again, weekly. I think you can just come hang out, no big deal. Um, so lots of opportunities. There's more organizations. There's an ISC Squared chapter. There's other, other chapters for all these things, other places. MySec Jackson, for instance. Um, so plenty of uh, plenty of things. So a couple of funny things, and, and these are kind of just to wrap up. I Like, the number of stupid things I've seen pen testing is just innumerable. So here's just a couple examples. Great website I was looking at. This is for an insurance provider that a lot of you probably have. Uh, going, going through one of their sites, looking around, I find some, uh, I actually don't think I put it in here, I found some default credentials in a PDF file that they put on Google to train the people to use the new software when they put it online. Found credentials, but they were unprivileged credentials, they were guest credentials. You could type some data in, get some bullshit data out, it, it had no value. What it did have is it gave me a session. So I was no longer an unauthenticated user, I had a session for some level of user privilege. 
I test the site, look for SQL injection, look for cross-site scripting, look for all these things, uh, look for crazy only things that happen in PHP type stuff, um, find nothing, and I'm about to like pack my stuff up and go home for this website. And then I'm like, I always have a list of like last ditch efforts, literally going to slash admin, took me the admin page, I was logged in as an admin now. Um, from there, there was actually another vulnerability. I really didn't do a good, good, good job two years ago making this. Uh, there was another vulnerability, but you can see how much I remember from doing these engagements. Because um, it's that one where they're dancing around at the end. Uh, that's how I feel or felt when I did this. Um, inside the admin, admin website, there was actually still no really useful information. It was actually still really boring information. Uh, I was like, oh, that sucks. Like, at least I can say I got admin and I have some data that I can show in the report and whatever. Um, uh, there was a Ajax query, so asynchronous JavaScript XML. There was an Ajax query that I saw like running in my browser. I was like, oh, that's interesting. And the fun thing is a lot of times developers, when they are doing like a query to a database, they're not being very specific with what they're querying from the database. And so what happened is you would never see it in the browser itself, but if you looked at the actual data stream of the XML coming back from the database server, it actually had not just the data it was displaying, but it also had the password hash of the users. Take the password hash, it's MD5, not, not salted, throw it into one of the hundred websites on the internet that can, pack, you know, has rainbow tables, um, got an admin account, gave the developer his, you know, own password at the, end, at the closeout call. Um, two, uh, property insurance. The, uh, you know, the, the, the point of OSINT doing recon, like I said at the start, a lot of recon time for most engagements you do. Um, because the thing is, for a lot of pen tests, you will have a day, you will have a weekend, you will have a week on a really, really, really large pen test when it's external. Um, it's, it's really not a lot of time when you think about how much time it can take to find a vulnerability and exploit it and laterally move and do all the things you need to do. Uh, so you spend a lot of time before the word go doing the recon part. Um, so in this case, I was going through Google. I found a development website that was going to clearly replace the, the current website for the, for the company. Dorked around the website. Um, I ran all the tools that you would run. I looked around. And then um, there's a really cool uh, WordPress, uh, WP scan, WordPress scanner. And it, and it has, I've actually submitted this bug that I found. Um, uh, it has a whole list of all the vulnerabilities that it knows about. And then it looks and enumerates plugins and enumerates information from WordPress sites. And it tells you if anything's vulnerable. So I ran that. It didn't find vulnerabilities. I was like, oh, that sucks. No, no vulnerabilities found. But I was like, you know, some of these are really weird plugins. And one of the weird plugins was a MySQL web interface, uh, PHP MyAdmin, but for WordPress. And I was like, oh, you know, I might, I might just try to dork around with that. So I did some weird path things here and there and tried, like, kind of getting into it. I looked at, I looked at the source code because it's open source. And the one thing, because I used to do, I used to be a WordPress developer, right? These are things that only you would know by, by going down that road. The one thing I noticed was it didn't actually have at the start of the stanza of the code, the part where it checks for a session. So I went to a specific URL in the path of that directory that was exposed on the internet and I was logged in without logging in. And now I had the entire SQL console, which means I have all the data. And again, same thing. MD5 passwords, dumped them, cracked them, actually rainbow tabled them, um, logged into their intranet that was exposed that I also found during recon, and then logged into their Outlook web, which if you're not familiar, is probably going to be owa.company.com. Um, logged in, sent an email to the person that I was testing as himself. Can't handle my swag. Um, and so, again, you hopefully <laughs> have read these two stories, and you're like, wow, those, are, those aren't hard. No, guess what? Because a lot of security sucks, and you will find things that you will be ashamed to find. Um, the, the important part to keep in mind is, like, while you might be doing CTFs a lot, CTFs are made in, in, in the vacuum of the CTF, right? There's some person thinking about how to intentionally break something. And intentionally broken software is far and away almost always more complex than real-life bro broken software. Real-life broken software is just bad sometimes. Uh, and these are two examples where very simple bugs, very easy things to fix, and very easy things never to have happen, they just kind of missed out. Um, so that's kind of the content for that. Um, anyone have questions? You can ask just about anything. I'll start us off. Um, how important did you find your uh, master's degree um, in kind of finding your career and how does that fit in? Um, yeah, my, when I did my master's degree, I was already... A, 
a handful of years into my career. Um, the master's degree, I guess, did probably two things. One, in undergrad, and, and reasonably so, you spend a lot of your time um, learning, especially in like programs like this, learning technical skills, right? Um, in grad school, at, at, at this university, grad school here, we're not a research university for computer security, okay? Uh, so if you go to like U of M, for instance, you will probably do research, like research proper, like the kind of stuff about that whole Diffie-Hellman thing I keep droning on about, uh, that hopefully some of you have Googled if you didn't know what I was talking about a second ago. Um, there are, I think, five or six researchers from U of M inside of the information security, um, not, they don't have a program technically, but comp sci students over there that do InfoSec and research. Um, they're the authors on that paper primarily, okay? Um, so grad school for me was a really good opportunity to refine my writing skills. Um, it was a good opportunity to do class projects with people that wanted to be there because a lot of people might be in undergrad because their parents told them they had to go undergrad. Just realistically, some of you are here for that. Um, I almost dropped out multiple times. My parents kept me kept me in school, basically, uh, and I'm glad I did. Um, uh, grad school, the kind of grad projects you work on are usually bigger picture. The team interaction is usually more profound. It's usually more in depth. It's usually more collaborative. It's not, oh, you do this and I'll do this and we'll put this together and maybe get a good grade. Uh, it's 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 a lot more work than that. Like my final research paper in um, like a stats class I did with a team of I think there were like three of us total was like something like 25 pages, including actual SPSS stats work, including surveys of populations, like on and on and on. Like it was a very involved process to get done. Um, so I, I think again, like the teamwork stuff, the the, the writing. Um, we didn't do a lot of public speaking, which I found kind of weird. Uh, I would have thought there would have been a little bit more of, of that. Um, the other thing is, incidentally, at least at the time I did the IA program or the IA focus uh, for my master's degree, you basically had the option for your capstone to either do a dissertation, which was not totally, but kind of focused. If you're going to do a PhD, you could kind of like lean in and get that part out of the way uh, as part of the finishing your, your master's, um, or you could go and take your CISSP. So I took my CISSP. <laughs> um, I, I wasn't planning to do a doctorate. I didn't see the need to spend a ton more time on something that I really didn't have a passion to do. Um, I do not necessarily have a need for a CISSP, but what I will say is that, uh, and a, a CISSP is a very good example, like I, I gave some stat, or half-assed stat earlier about it. Um, there is a lot of need for a CISSP right now. The other thing is, depending on the role you take, um, you might not you might not ever need a CISSP, but the one time you do, you're like, awesome, right? Uh, I've had clients that do, um, uh, they do military contracts, and one of the requirements with the DOD on their behalf is to have a certain, one of these certifications um, just as a baseline cover their ass, right? We don't want people in here that don't have some reason to be here, and the CISSP is one of the things that the DOD smiles upon. Have it, have it and not need it versus need it and not have it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, uh, again, and it's another it's another thing where, especially while you're in university and maybe you're going through and can do study groups on campus, like that's a fun way to learn. Um, and, again, it's good, good networking overall. Questions? Yeah. Yeah, so I'm a sophomore and I just started like in this field. I was wondering when was like the right time to start doing internships and stuff like that. Oh, I mean, as soon as, soon as you can get one. Yeah, as soon as you can get one. Um, it, it, it kind of also depends on um, if you want an internship for kind of the focus you think you might have outside of college or if you want an internship just to kind of get your resume with like cool companies or, or big companies. So you can be like, oh, I worked in a, you know, I worked at Ford. You know, no matter what you're doing at Ford, being, you know, 19, 20, 21, working at Ford is always going to be kind of impressive in IT uh, because you can go across the country, like, we're, you know, well, to some degree, I'm sure some of you moved here. Um, yeah, I grew up in Dearborn, literally Ford World Headquarters, right? Um, everyone I know worked at Ford at some point probably in their lives, but you go out west and they're like, oh, you were like one of the big three, like, that's really impressive. Um, just certain names on your resume can put you up. It's like going to like an Ivy League school, like certain places you work. So as soon as someone will give you an internship, take it. Um, and th that's probably another thing that I mentioned. Uh, it's, it's actually funny because I don't know if I'm a millennial or what I'm supposed to be. But um, it's super funny. I see some of these things where there's like this like super like 
SNL and stuff have like all these things about like entitlement. I will say to a, an honest degree, if you think you deserve to get paid for an internship, you don't. Okay. You are getting paid. You're just not getting paid today. Um, that internship will pay off for you. That internship will get you a higher salary than you would have had. It will get you a job ahead of the person before you. Okay. So don't just go, Oh, I have to get paid for an internship. You, you, you probably don't. I mean, if you really need the money that bad, okay. Like I'm not going to say no, but, um, Suck it up if you have to for four months. Do an internship somewhere. It will pay dividends the rest of your career. Um, my career, I, I would say, effect, effectively, my career started when I was in high school. Um, I was a Unix administrator for a shell hosting company. Shell hosting means nothing to most of you, probably. Think of shell hosting as the old school poor man's uh, cl uh, cloud, right? You would have one server with individual user accounts, and you would share that one server amongst 100 people, 200 people. Like, it was... It was a totally shared server. Um, I took, uh, I made a connection from just talking to people online, talking about security with people. Uh, the guy that ran the shell hosting company, uh, Dennis actually remembers his name. Um, uh, I was talking to him, I'm like, oh, like, it, I, like, I really wanna do Unix administration, I really like information security, I do all these things in like this like, you know, lab I have at home. And he's like, okay, well, I could really use a hand with some of this. And he's like, but I really can't pay you a lot. I was like, well, how much is a lot? He's like, I don't know, like 50 bucks a month. Uh, I was like, oh, to do what? He's like, you know, like administer boxes, set boxes up, talk to clients, talk to you know, or customers, fix things, look at logs, basically be a full sysadmin. Um, uh, and I was like, 50 bucks? Okay. Um, I, I, did that for, I did that for almost two years at $50 a month to do what I would have gotten paid like in today's, in today's money, not that... CPI has changed. But like for that kind of work that I was doing, if that was a real job, that was a $60,000 a year job easily. Okay. I was getting paid $50 a month and smiling for every moment because I knew how valuable that was. The first job I got out of undergrad, I actually got hired to the University of Michigan Dearborn as the Unix admin for the College of Engineering and Computer Science. The only reason I got that job is because I had on my resume that I did systems administration for two years. There's no way they would have given me the job. I was actually against a f now friend of mine who was 10 years older than me and had been working in IT for that 10 years. And I beat him for a job. I hadn't even got my degree finished from EMU. Okay. So whether it's an internship, whether it's a full-time job for no money, you will win. You will absolutely win because the, the reality is the quicker you start your career, the more money you will make in your career. Um, now there's obviously a, a weight, a weight and balance to that. Like go, you should go to school, you should get a degree because that will get you through all the HR filters. If that's the only reason you're here, you're completely right. It will get you through HR filters. <laughs> um, um, and at the end of the day, like, yeah, you can totally. And I, I think one of the things and I, I, I picked on people at the converge uh, thing as well with this one, which is, um, luckily it doesn't apply to you. Maybe it will. If some of you are thinking about, you know, not being in school. Um, but, there are more than enough people that I've talked to who did not go to uh, college or dropped out of college. And <laughs> they, how they do it with a straight face is beyond me. But they're like, oh, well, you know, Steve Jobs didn't go to college and Bill Gates didn't go to college. I'm like, you're not either of those people. You're, you, I, I will never be Bill Gates. You will never be Steve Jobs. They are uh, an outlier beyond outlier, okay? Um, if you, don't, if you don't go to college, you don't get a four-year degree or a two-year degree or you go get a grad school or whatever, um, that's completely fine because there are, ton of, there are a ton of people in the industry that don't go to college and are hugely successful because they work their fucking ass off all the time. They go to college. They just don't do it in a college, right? They are learning constantly. They're doing their own education their own way. Um, so my question is, and I've, I've not said this in a hiring because I probably would get sued, but effectively, when I talk to someone that doesn't have a college degree and I see like their career, I'm like, oh, like explain what you did these years exactly. Um, you know, the years that you should have been in college probably. If you've been working really hard, you've been doing awesome projects, you've been presenting, you've been doing content, you've been working, you've been growing your career, good. But the reality is, unless you can show me two or four years of accelerated learning beyond where your students are that went to college, I'm always going to take a college student before I don't. I will always take a college student for a job before I don't. Um, college is a pain in the ass. College is slow. College is tedious. College has really frustrating people you have to deal with. College makes you do things that you would never otherwise do. 
College has a lot of ancillary benefits that you will never know unless you went to college. Okay? You will be very happy you went to college one day if you're not right now. Uh, I assure you of that. Um, so if you're here, you're probably in college, stay in college, get, get your degree. It will, uh, it will do a lot for you. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, so let's say, hypothetically, you're a uh, college student going full-time, working part-time, full-time, don't have a lot of you know, spare time to, to do whatever. Say you can get an hour a week. What would you recommend is like, the most the bang for your buck? Um, uh, use that one hour to drink a Red Bull and get four more hours. Um, <laughs> I, you know, I, I, and honestly, I, and I, and I, I you know, I kind of mean that a little bit seriously. I, I didn't really like Red Bull personally, um, but um, I, I think the reality is so during undergrad, uh, during undergrad, I did, uh, I, I had uh, full, I always had twelve credit hours or more, usually twelve to fifteen, um, and uh, from. From my second semester of freshman year all the way to the very end, as many hours as I was allowed to work on campus, because I had a campus job at the help desk, um, and then also COT for a while, as many hours as I was allowed to work, I worked. Um, so that, that during the week, you know, during the, the um, fall and winter semesters, that was, I don't know, like 20 <coughs> some hours, I would think. Um, so I spent a lot of time in... And it depends on what job, job you have. If you can, get an IT job. Any IT job will do. You do not have to have a cool IT job. But get an IT job, um, A, because you get the experience in IT, which is always beneficial. But B, there's, in many IT jobs, a lot of downtime. Um, and there are opportunities to work on stuff that you want to work on. Obviously, if you're checking someone out as a cashier at a register, you don't probably have time to really like hack on a VM. But if you're in an environment where you already have a computer in front of you, you can allocate your time creatively sometimes. Uh, so try to position yourself so you have more time in that regard. Um, I think the other thing would be um, you need to, if possible, decide not, I would say, a focus of your career, but something that you think is at least germane to your career. So, for instance, if you want to be a, um, if you want to do penetration testing and you don't know C or you don't know Python or you don't know X, Y, or Z, Start learning that. I would probably say uh, the reason being is even if you know one programming language, like I've never written a line of .NET in my life. I've never written a line of Python in my life. I've never uh, I've written a little Java because of EMU's comp sci program for the while. The while that I was part of that, um, but I found vuln after vuln after vuln. Okay, um, knowing programming, knowing programming in the general sense, uh, uh, you will you will get huge, huge residuals from just knowing one language really well because a lot of languages look very similar. Um, so and a lot of your job was very, very helpful. <laughs> my my tic-tac-toe board was amazing, man. Um, uh, yeah, so I, I, think, I think if you don't know a programming language, do that. Um, otherwise, I would say if you feel like you're at a point where you're like, okay, I know how to use some tools, I know some programming, I know some sysadmin stuff, I know some network engineering stuff. Like if you have a little bit of everything, you should start working on projects or, and projects meaning offensive security research projects. You can um, make a project doing a research project of some other ilk and then working on presentation for that project. Use your IA uh, students as you should come up here and give that presentation before you submit it to conferences. Have people review your abstracts for conferences, work off people. Um, the, the same things that people at CFP committees think students probably think just as, as well. Like if, if your talk sounds interesting, it'll probably get accepted. Uh, there's a lot of bad talks that get accepted, not just saying you should phone it in and give a bad talk, but um, an abstract and a title is 85 or 90 percent of what most um, uh, kind of uh, CFP committees will look at. Sometimes that will be 100 percent because some uh, committees for uh, conference paper, well conference papers, they will actually do blind um, assessment of those talks. So they will only see the abstract and the title. They will not see who you are. It doesn't matter if you're an EMU student. It doesn't matter if you're the guy that's coming, Tomas, whatever, with a really cool job title and stuff. Um, they won't know the difference, right? They're judging you literally on your title and your abstract. So, um, you know, use, use that to your benefit as well. Um, it's, you know, I, I can think back to a lot of time I wasted, and I gen genuinely mean wasted. Like, I built more Linux kernels in, like, Best Hall than anyone ever needs to build Linux kernels just because I was, like, obsessed with, like, getting the perfect, like, Linux kernel set up on my laptop to make sure my video card ran really well so I could, pl 
so I could play Counter-Strike with my crappy whatever chipset was in that at that time. Um, there is a lot of time you will probably waste. There's some benefit. Um, I think I think the biggest thing is make you know make a little bit of a concerted effort to prioritize. Um, certain things you learn, like so for instance, if you learn how to program, then you can do code auditing and you can look for vulnerabilities. If you don't know how to program, you're gonna have a hard time, right? Um, so prioritize, like learn things you don't know. Um, the U of M property disposition, yeah. <laughs> I spent a boatload of money there when I was an undergrad. Um, it's got the weirdest hours in the world, but when it's open, they have, well, they had, I don't know what the hell they do anymore. Um, they had Cisco gear that I'd buy. They had Sun uh, Spark stations, which is completely irrelevant to all of you now. Um, they had a ton of cool stuff that you can get for way cheaper than eBay will ever have it for. Hack on it, learn from it, put that in your lab. I, I mean, there's a lot of cool projects that you can do just by doing that. Um, there's even sometimes medical device equipment that comes through the U of M Dispo. Um, and just like kind of IoT security research, medical device security research is hugely popular right now. Uh, there's a company that Joe and I were talking about earlier, uh, Verta Labs, uh, who's doing some interesting things with um, machine learning as a means to understand electrical vo voltages coming out of devices, whether or not it's been compromised or not. And their primary focus is medical devices. If you have an interest in that kind of world, whether it's machine learning side, the offensive security, the defensive security, if you can find a medical device and just like do a quick paper or do a presentation somewhere, I mean, like, you, you would be shocked at how little people work to impress any of us when we hire people. Like, no one's doing anything to impress us. You're like, went to school, got my four-year degree, give me a job. Um, one little project will set you so far above everyone else. It's not even funny. Um, so anything you can do, just find something, get passionate about it for a couple months, do it, put a deck together, give it at one conference, you will have an internship if you don't already. Questions? This is a random question, it's sort of like irrelevant maybe, but uh, Frank 2 at Rapid7, did you know him? Or Frank 2, okay. what was his last name? Uh, I don't remember his last name. Was it with a C, like Cap? It was, oh. His first name was Taylor. It's, it's, it's okay. Oh, I... It was Frank too. Yeah, oh yeah. yeah. Okay, I see. It's all right. Yeah. No. Uh, yeah. Rapid Seven. Um, uh, I guess I should talk about my company some. Eh, I don't care. Um, so we we have we have like 750 people, and we're distributed Ireland to California to Boston to. Uh, you He's know. a personal hero. So yeah. Just, oh. Like, maybe touch them or something. Sounds like a good person then. I wish I was a personal hero to anyone. I'm not even a personal hero to my dog. So. Um, <laughs> Any 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 questions, random or not, are completely fine. What was your favorite conference to speak at? Ooh, that's a great question. Um, because of the conference or because of the actual presentation? Let's say because of the presentation. Oh, I hate my presentations. Um, because I'm on stage. Who cares? Um. Conference. Uh, well, I, I guess that's kind of an easy one. So two years ago, I spoke at DEF CON. Um, uh, there's a lot of ways to speak at DEF CON, by the way. Like, you, there's there's village. At, like this year, I spoke at DEF CON at the IoT Village. Uh, there's Social Engineering Village, there's Industrial Control Village, State Village, whatever. Um, but I spoke at DEF CON proper, like one of the three tracks of DEF CON, like on giant ass stage in Vegas. Um, that was easily the coolest thing I've ever done. I mean, uh, myself and Zach Lanier, who's a good buddy of mine. Um, uh, I, we didn't. We didn't. We couldn't count how many people were there. All we knew is it was the the biggest room, and we were, we were standing room only for it. So it was somewhere like in the thousand ish number of people. Um, you know, you can't you can't beat an opportunity like that. So um, best conference though, because I I, I find more fun in that. Um, so one one important thing, Shmukon. She brought up uh, at the start. Uh, Shmukon <laughs> is probably my year to year favorite conference. Um, a, I love DC. DC is just a great place to be and hang out and have fun. Um, B, ShmooCon puts a lot of time and thought into their uh, conference in terms of who they're bringing in. They're very receptive to newer speakers. In fact, they try uh, to the detriment of you know the old and and uh, uh, you know seasoned veterans. They they really try to bring newer people in. Um, so again, if you if you can go to ShmooCon, do um, I think it's awesome they have that uh, yeah. kind of scholarship you going on. Get out there. No reason not to apply. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. Um, 
And I don't know if they still do it. I, someone said they don't, but I don't know if I believe them. Um, so one of the things about ShmooCon is ShmooCon is possibly, if not totally, the hardest conference to get a ticket to. Um, ShmooCon, what they do, they do three rounds of tickets, and they split it up into, like, there's a big bulk, I think, at the start, and then smaller amount and smaller amount. Um, and every year, there's on Twitter, like, you follow Twitter, you'll see, oh, like, you know, people will... Be like, okay, I've got my F5 ready for ShmooCon. Like, it is, it is like something that sells out in less than 10 seconds. Okay? It sells out extremely quick. The trick is, and I'm not saying you should abuse this, but the trick is you should, um, if you think about giving a talk there, which you should if you have something you feel, you know, like you want to give a talk about there, um, submit the talk. Because in past years, even if you submitted a talk and got rejected, they will, they will place hold a ticket for you to, to buy at your leisure. Still okay. Um, so I'm, again, don't game the system just to game the system. But if you are honestly trying to speak at ShmooCon, uh, that's kind of maybe an ancillary benefit, and maybe you you get there. But uh, highly recommended to go. Uh, the only trick is DC in the winter is very unpredictable. Uh, I was there three or no, three or four years ago where it it was called at least with us like the the Shmoopocalypse um, because DC was just destroyed by snow. Um, like our glass ceiling literally caved in the hotel, the metro shut down, my flight got delayed two days, um, uh, and they also throw a completely open bar party at a club downtown DC in DuPont Circle usually, which is just an amazing time by itself. So uh, if you're not familiar yet, InfoSec people like to party, go back to the thing about said about stress. Um, InfoSec conferences usually have a lot of partying. Keep in mind that people that party with sometimes are the people that might hire you in the future, so you know, make make good decisions. But um, yeah. Any other questions? Cool. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's great to be back on campus. And uh, if you have anything else, please you know shoot me an email. I'm usually best to respond at that address. Uh, Twitter, I'm not on as much. Um, but again, I have a bunch of slide decks at the speaker deck. Um, uh, so if there's anything you see up there, you're like, oh, tell me more about this topic, we can totally chat via email. Um, and I'm usually in Ann Arbor like a couple times a month. So if you're around, maybe I'll swing by campus on the way if you need to talk about something. So uh, thank you very much.